this is uh, the Gold 7 book club for, of the Alpha for Data Science. And today we'll be looking at uh, chapter three of the book, which is uh, the work, uh, the work uh, uh, Mr. Tim Newby will be taking us through the chapter. So over to you, Josh, you are free to share your screen. Okay, Kat, thank you very much. So let's top one share. Okay. And everything's gone. Oh, we'd like to record this screen. Yeah. Okay, so we've got those preferences. Let me just, all my screens have gone a bit crazy now, I think. So I need that open and that open and hopefully, right, yeah. Can, can everybody hear me okay and see my screen? Yes, yeah, but we yeah. cannot see your screen for now. Oh you, oh, you can't see the screen? Yeah, I can see you, but not your screen, yeah. Not the screen. Shared, yeah. So I press share and then I just press share here. Yes, yes. You click on share screen, then you select the specific screen that you want to share, the one containing the slide. That doesn't seem to come up here, does it? Because I've got oh, desktop yes. one, but there's something it doesn't like about it. So once you click share, you will see all the screen days for you to select the screen with this slide. Open system preferences, but nothing matches. No, once you click on the share screen, yeah. it, will show, it will show a dialog box of all the screen that you select the specific screen that you want to share. But the I, one I, containing the slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. It's not actually showing me a picture. I'm, I've got you. So if I switch, how do I switch between screens or can't I once I start? Now, once you click on the share screen, your slide is open already, the notes. So once you I'm click on the share yeah. screen, just select the notes, select the notes from the drop down. select, make sure you click on the notes. Sure. Click on the notes. Click on the notes, I can't see the... I can select multi. I'm not quite sure what I'm. So I've clicked on this. That's the screen I want to share. Yeah. And then I press share. Yes, yes. And then it's asking me to give it some access. So I'll just open system. I've, I think I've got to give it permission to share, have I, somewhere? That's what it's no. not like. No, you are free. You can share because even me, I myself, I can share. You have access, you can share. Yeah. So if I click, I want to sh share this window. So when I press share, this opens up. Yes. So I click open system preferences. No, you don't need to go into brief system preferences. But if I just press cancel, I'm just stuck here, yeah? Um, uh, did, is it asking where your files are, the system preferences? No, not the system preferences. It's like, are you using Mac or Windows? So I'm on a Mac, yeah. Okay, the Mac is, um, maybe I am not sure, but see on the bottom where it says participants, chat, share screen, record, reactions, and apps. Do you see that on the bottom? Yeah. Okay. Try clicking on share screen. Yeah, so that's here. And how? What do you see there? Oh, you can't see the screen at the moment, then. So I, I've got a list of screens. I can share desktop one. Okay. Or I've got very. I've got a window with R Studio open in it, and then I've got some browser windows. Okay. Now, um, uh, it's, do you uh, try? Uh, do you uh, where are your slides? Is it on desktop one or so, on... so the slides? The slides are in Safari, but I've only got the one monitor, which is desktop one. Okay, try clicking on the desktop one. Yeah. Okay. And then okay. I press share. Yes. Share yes. that. And now it's yes. saying allow Zoom to share your screen 
open system preferences, security and privacy to grant access. Oh, yes. Yes, you, you got that disabled. So, yes, try clicking so that. I think I've got, to, I've got to go to system preferences to, to give Zoom permission to share yes. my screen. Yes, that's a privacy settings that you have to undo. Yeah. Man. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, you got it uh, disabled for your security and I yeah. think it's more secure. So if I allow that. So it doesn't want to share this screen at all. Or uh, do you have <laughs> do you have the slides so that you know either you either I can or oh anybody else can do that for you i can't i can do that for him maybe should i share my own slide then you use my own slide to present yeah yeah i, th I think i'm going to have to i'm afraid it doesn't seem to be letting me share okay. yeah kind of you know either you have to restart your mac sometimes oh. you know for the preferences to take care of oh, okay let me uh, I'm coming, let me share. Okay, oh, brilliant. So we've got the slides. Um, so finally, we've got some slides on the screen anyway. So this is what we're, we're looking at today, chapter three, which is the basics really of how to operate the RStudio interface. Um, we're going to look particularly at how to use the command line in R. Um, we're going to talk a bit about good style conventions when you write code, um, and that will help other people to understand what you've been trying to do, or if you have to come back to something later on, you know, you'll understand, or it'll remind you what you were thinking of when you wrote some horribly complicated piece of code and have to go back to it in the future. Um, and also we'll talk a bit how we can call up different functions in our so if we um, move on to the next slide here we go so this shows the um console pane um so basically when you open R, you've got four windows the one at the bottom left is referred to the console pane and basically whatever we type into the console pane it'll actually carry out that command or that instruction and then print out the answer to that. So you can do things like use R as a calculator by typing in one plus one or something. I had hoped at this point to be able to switch between slides and my R console so we could actually run through it, but I, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. And it might come up a bit later in the slides anyway. So if we, that's, that's the console anyway. If we go on to the next slide, Okay, the script pane, this is where we actually write programs in R. So the console just enter single commands. The script line, we actually write a program, a sequence of instructions um, using R, and then we can run that as well. Um, and pr from there, we can actually save programs. So if we come back into R, we can then upload the um, script again, and we can rerun that same program in the future. Any work we do in the console will be lost when we um, leave the session and restart. But by saving it through the, um, the um, script pane, we can actually come back and, and re, um, reuse that same code. So if we go on to the next slide, we've got the environment pane. Um, so this actually shows various different things. So in there, basically, you'll have things like the tables that you've got loaded up into, into your um, session via the, um, the programs that you run. And there's also information there on history um, of, of that session and other active connections. So as you run code, or even if you run commands through the console sec um, panel, you'll actually start seeing them appear in your environment. And then also, if we look at the, the last of the four screens, which is on the next slide, we've got what's been called the other pane. They didn't seem to bother to give it a proper name, 
but um, in the other pane, there, we've got various things. We've got a list of the files that um, are in our current workspace. Um, I think you can actually see the address of your current workspace next to the home icon. That actually tells you where your current working directory is, lists the files within it. And then if we use other commands within R, things like ggplot, if we plot graphs, they would appear in the plot section of there. We can see different packages we load up into R through the packages tab. Um, help, if we access help via the console or in any other way, we'll actually get the answers to those questions we ask in the help part. Um, and I can't remember what the viewer does. <laughs> <laughs> but basically all of those different bits work together um, and you can actually, I, I don't know if, if you're all familiar with this, but you can actually um, zoom into any other any panel as well. So on my Mac, if I've got R open, I can do control one and it will fill my entire screen with the console. Or if I do control two, I can fill the entire screen with the, um, the, the um, or what's it called, the one where the script runs. So you can actually select a screen and just look at one in isolation, or you can have a view of all of them so you can see what's going on in one view. So that's a quick introduction to the different bits. Does that all make sense to everybody? Are there any questions on any of that before we move on? Okay, I can just add one or two things there. Okay, like in the console pane, we can see that we also have the terminal tab. Okay, and within the terminal tab, we can also run, we can also run for, uh, R within the terminal file. We can also run our scripts within the terminal. And also within the terminal, we can add some other tabs, like the jobs tabs. We can run some scripts in the background. Maybe we are doing some kind of analysis that is going to take a longer time so we can set that up within the job. So the, our script will just be running until when we get uh, the outputs. Then in the connection here, we can also connect uh, the R Studio pen to a database. We can, we can connect it to a database when we are, and we can use it in doing a lot of work. And also there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts because for you to be really effective using the house studio is better. We try to learn the keyboard shortcut like the control shift one, which is going to open up the script pane, the control shift tool, which will take us to the console. So when you look control shift care, which will give us the entire dialog box of all the necessary keyboard shortcuts, because for you to be very effective, it's better we learn uh, the keyboard shop shortcut is going to what increase our workflow while working uh, within the our studio IDE. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, if there's no other questions, we'll move on. So um, we're going to look at each of those different bits now. So first of all, we've got the console. If any of you are able to open up R and try this as we go through it, feel free to do that. Um, but basically, if you enter whatever you enter, basically, it's just going to interpret that as best it can and then print it out. So if you enter the number four, you can see it's just returning in the first object within that is the number four. It's just telling you what you've typed in, in that case. And I think if we go onto the next slide, will it show it, the console? Yeah, so you can type in various different things through the console. So if you just type in pi, that's obviously a recognized object within the R programming language, and you can see it's returning R, uh, it's returning the value of pi to six decimal places. Um, and of course, it's not just single objects. If you have letters, we've got um, what I think is, is that would that be a vector, would it, or a list? So you've got a large number of different objects or variables under the heading of letters, which is basically the letters of the alphabet in English. So if you type in letters, it actually gives you 26 different items that are returned, and they're the letters A through to Z um, number there. And you can see the numbers on the left, it's showing you the number of the item immediately next to the number. So A is the first item in letters, 
and T is the 20th item in letters. And it doesn't bother trying to number all of the letters between that. So you just get the object at the start of each line. Um, and if you want to go away and play with this, you can actually copy all of these by with the copy icons as well. So that's pretty cool. And I think that's all I've got on that one. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, so there we're looking at something slightly more complicated within a lot of the packages, of course, um, there are data sets already. I'm sure you've probably come across them as, as you've played around with R up to now, but within ggplot2, which is one of the packages in R, there's also um, a data set called diamonds. And so if you type in ggplot, the two colons basically are just telling R that the next bit you refer to is actually from that package ggplot, and you're looking at diamonds. And what it's doing, the return from that is telling you diamonds is a tibble, which is a particular type of data frame um, with, what's it, 53,000, nearly 54,000 lines and 10 columns. And then it shows you what, um, I think it's managed to fit all of the columns in, in that case, hasn't it? Has it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's showing all 10 columns and it's actually just showing us the first 10 rows. So we can actually see, um, we can see what's, what the structure of that data set is. So we can't see all of the data in it, but we can actually see the structure and the type of information. Also under the column headings, it actually tells you what type of data what is stored in each column. So a double is a decimal figure. Um, order is ORD, that means it's an order. So it looks like text, but it's got special meanings in R, which you know, we won't come on to for a fair bit, but it has it does have special meanings, um, as, as is the case with colour and clarity. And then all of the other figures actually are, again, decimal numbers. OK, any questions or comments on that before we move on? No. There we go. So when we actually enter a thing, what it's really saying is work out what I've just said and then print out the answer. So if you ask for the, co the cosine of pi, that is coming up as minus one, or if you just want to calculate the equation on the charts. Oops, sorry, I missed, the, where is that? The charts, on the charts. Is Tibble, yeah, a Tibble um, is, um, is a, a special type of table. It has certain special properties. And I think uh, Mr. Odelay, it's probably better if you pick that up. <laughs> A table, I uh, think table uh, is table and data frame that is two different type of thing. The table, what the table is do is that does is that the table is the modern data frame. Because if you like now we have ggplot2, we have all with the two column. That means we are calling the da diamond data set. We, without us loading ggplot, we are accessing the diamond data set that is from the namespace from package ggplot and it returns a table. So what a table does differently from a data frame is that the table will print the first 10 rows. You can see, and at the bottom, every other information we announce, it will now give us with 53,930 more rows. It will now give you information of the other rows. Then tables will always give you the, it's always give you the name of the variable, and the type of the variable. That is one thing table does. But if you go back to the traditional data frame and you just call GG, uh, we just call the data frame, it's going to print everything and it's going to fill up our entire console. So the modern way of doing this is always with a table because table will always print the first 10 rows and every other thing will just say with so, 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 so number of rows which makes everything neat. That is what it can, what table return is, what can fit into the screen of our R console. So that is what it is. It's going to return the first 10, then it will now give you with so, so, so number of rows so that you know, okay, we have, so with that, we can see, we can have an idea of the type of data set in which we are working with. I don't know if I've been able to answer your question. Yeah. There's also a mention of table function. So is there a table function in R and is that 
different or similar to a table? No, it's different from table. It's different from table. Table is different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. So, from my understanding, uh, so a table gives us the frequency of the variables, while a table is just a modern form of the data frame output yes. Of 10 rows. Yes, 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 All right. yes. All right, I got you. Okay. Let's just, can I move the chat out the way there for a minute? Okay. Right, so yeah, have we we covered the no we, we yeah I just started on this, hadn't I? So basically looking at how you can type in thing of cosine of pi and how you can use R as a normal calculator. So if you just want to do sums, you can easily type them into the console and it'll give you the answers. So there it's showing a multiplication of three numbers with the answer 86,400. So that's just some of the things you can do within the console. If we go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so we can also within our, either within the console or within a program, assign names to variables or objects, whatever we might um, choose to, to want to create um, as, some, as a named item really. So in this case, it's actually using that, that less that's arrow sign with a little dash next to it um basically i think somewhere else it will say that you know it's good to think of that as that arrow symbol as being gets so the idea is that by actually you finding words to represent those symbols we can activate the la language part of our brain which actually makes it quicker for us to learn and understand so what it's saying there is tau gets two times pi so we've defined tau as being two times pi. Um, and as it says there below, um, not a lot of other languages, you can use the equal sign, but when you're assigning a variable, it's not quite the same thing mathematically as being equal to, it has a different special meaning. So for that reason, it's, um, it's better to actually use the gets symbol, arrow dash. And um, it's also telling us that we can use a keyboard shortcut, which is a little bit easier. So if you do Alt and minus, you'll actually get that get symbol automatically. And then if you remember at the start, the panel to the right of the script panel was the environment panel. If you create an object called tau in using that command, you will then see tau appear in your environment panel. And it's an object you can refer to in any other commands you enter either through the console or in other parts of script that you're writing, or I guess through the terminal or wherever you might want to refer to those objects from. So you can set up an object and we can use it many times without having to sort of type in two times pi every time. Okay, so if everyone's happy, we'll move on. Um, and as we saw on the previous slide, it, if you enter just tau without the brackets, it's not going to give you an answer. It's just going to put tau into the environment pane and remember what you've entered. But if you surround that in brackets, it will actually put it into the environment plane and remember that object. But it will also tell you what the result of um, whatever calculation you might have used to assign that object. It will give you that result. Or if it's just um, a number, it will tell you what the number you entered was. So it'll print out the result of that assignment as well as store it in the environment pane. Okay. Um, oh, this is what I mentioned earlier, really, is um, you know, if the language part of the brain is it's a large part of the brain. So if we can actually use that, it's easier to learn. Um, so there it's saying, you know, say we would say that written text as tau gets two times pi. So it helps us think about the structure of the code we're writing and come to understand it quicker. If we get used to saying things in our head, I guess, as we're learning how to, to, to use these commands. Okay, if everyone's happy with that, we'll move on. Um, so tau is an example of naming things. We can name variables, we can name all sorts of different objects. Um, as it says here, there, 
you know, there's only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things and off by one errors. So there's lots of hard things actually, but one of them is naming things. Um, and it's important to get right. It's very helpful if we get into habits of naming things well, um, because when you come, you know, you might want to come back and look at something you've written a long time in the future. So you want that to be able to be understood quite easily. And also other people might have to work with your code or they might want to help um, review some of your work. And again, if it's easy to understand, it makes all of that um, process easier. And I think if you're working in teams with other people as well, it makes life so much easier if you all use the same conventions, the way you name files, the way you name objects. Um, if everybody has the same way of doing things, life is just much simpler for, for everyone, really. So, um, so there's all sorts of different ways you can do it, but names in R can only be letters, numbers. You can use the underscore and the dot, but you can only use those characters when you're naming things. It's case sensitive. So you need to actually be careful whether you're using upper or lower case. And again, you know, if we can all stick to a good style convention, that will make life a lot easier. So, you know, you can either have everything in lower case, which, um, you know, I think that's just lower case or people talk about camel case or snake case. So you might capitalize the first letter in every word, or you might just capitalize the first letter of the phrase um, and then leave everything else lower case. The most important thing is that you do it consistently. So do it how it works for you, but make sure that you're, you're doing it in a consistent way, really, and ideally consistently with other people you're regularly working with. Um, the other thing is you always want names. It makes life a lot easier if you choose a name that makes sense and reminds you of the object that you're naming. So you could use some strange sequence of numbers and letters as a name. That's not the R will cope with that absolutely fine. But if you've given something some really obscure label like T2Y3 or something, if you're not using the, that regularly, you might not know what T2Y3 is. But if you give it a name, something quite descriptive, like the example at the bottom there, Fall 2020 Math Courses with multiple sections, you read that and it's pretty obvious exactly what that, that is. And, you know, good code is something that you can understand easily and other people can. OK. Um, and we can also use different functions. And I, I guess we're all familiar with functions from um, other work before now. In the case of R, um, a function is basically it's just um, a box. You put in an input and it spits out the answer to that. And then just whatever goes on inside that box is what we're calling the function. Um, and different functions can take any number of um, inputs from zero through to whatever you can cope with, really. And then when you call that function, you will specify those values or arguments for the inputs. And then evaluating the function call gives the output of the function. They're actually shown the function below there of length. And that is a function that actually just looks at the number of items in an object. So the object letters that we saw earlier, which was all the letters in the English alphabet, if we evaluate that with the function length, we get the answer 26. So there are 26 items or object items, 26 letters in that um, object called letters. Um, in another example below, you've got n row, and that's actually asking the question, what is the number of rows? And then we've passed the argument ggplot2 diamonds. So we're asking how many rows are there in ggplot2? And we're getting the answer 53,940. So we can, and again, we can obviously do that in any of the, the console pane, the um, script pane, um, and it'll do exactly the same thing pretty much. Um, it mentions there some functions can have side effects, um, which we'll talk about later. I don't really know much about what they are at the moment, unless anybody wants to. Mr. Odelay, do we want to say anything about that now? Or yeah, I think the, there is a there is a chapter about function. Maybe that is what they are referring to here. 
Yeah. There's a section about where we we'll talk more on the function. So I think that is what they refer to in this chapter. Okay, good. Right, and if everyone's happy with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so the input or the function parameters can also have names. So you can, um, you can actually pass um, the arguments it to the function using the names. So they've used a function sequence, and then we've got uh, within that, we've got um, arguments called from and to. Um, so we can use the name sequence from one to 10, basically is creating a sequence of integers from one through to 10. Um, quite often you don't actually need to put the names in, but of course it makes it easy to read because if you just had sequence one comma 10, you know, if you were, if you hadn't used that command re recently, it might not be quite so easy to understand exactly what it's doing. But if you're saying from one to 10, it's pretty much telling you what that command's doing. Um, so it's much easier to understand. And the other thing is if we name it, we're explicitly telling R what that object, what that argument is. So if we say sequence two, 10 from one, it knows we want to start um, at one and we want to go to 10. So even though we put 10 first, we're saying that's where we want to go to, that's the destination. So it knows to put it last. Whereas if we just put sequence 10 comma one, it would assume that the first number we put in is actually the number we want to start from. So by doing that, you can see starting from one going to 10, we actually get a different answer. We're going down from 10 down to one. So specifying the names of these can also make avoid any mistakes or trip ups by putting things in the wrong place and getting slightly unexpected results. Um, yeah, anything else on that? No, everyone happy? Cool. Um, so we've got some other so interesting things that um, are worth playing about. We've got tab autocomplete. And this, again, if you're able to open up R, if you start typing commands, you, you'll actually see it starts coming up with suggestions of what commands you want. And if you hit tab, it'll actually use that command. So if you've got a fairly long command that might be awkward to type in, you can actually use autocomplete for that. And autocomplete, I believe, will actually see if you've got um, object names that you've defined, it will actually offer those up as suggestions as well. Um, you could use up and down arrows. So if within the console you use the up and down arrows, you can actually get a history of the commands that R has carried out. So it might be whether you entered that command through the console or if you entered it as from a program via script, going up and down arrow will actually show you the history of all the commands that that session has, um, has used. I don't know what the limit on it is. I guess there is a limit of how many commands it will remember. Um, you can use type then commands control up to search through the history. I think Mr. O'Dley mentioned all shift K. That's a brilliant one because you get a lift of every single shortcut that's available in R in one screen. So that's really good. And then a cool one you can do, alt command with down arrow inside a script that will actually copy that line of script to the line below as well, if you're actually working within the script pane. So if you're repeating a line and just want to change a variable or change it slightly, it's a great way to save um, having to type all of that line in again. So there's lots of different shortcuts and things, which obviously we can't go through all of those now, but they're worth getting to know because um, as Mr. O'Delay said, um, you know, we could be much more effective, much more efficient in our work by knowing all the different shortcuts and the most efficient ways of doing different things. Okay, any questions or anything else on that? Oh, and that's it. I finished. <laughs> there were some exercises as well, weren't there, which um, aren't in there. So I don't know if we can look at those or if you've got something else you want to speak about. Uh, 
I think anything I want to ask, should we look at the keyboard shortcuts? There were some yeah. other commands you were talking about. So let me stop. Which screen should I share because of? Have... Oh, let me see. Okay, you were talking about uh, the keyboard shortcut for all the command. I think Control Shift G. Yeah, Alt Shift G, which shows us all the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, to switch tab, move to source. So these are all the keyboard shortcuts that are available in the R Studio IDE. These are all the keyboard shortcuts. So there are there are lots for you. So it's just the one you use frequently. It's better you know the keyboard shortcuts for that. So if you click on this, and you can also modify these keyboard shortcuts into to, to to a specific function in which you want to use. <laughs> I also discover also is that if you come to the terminal, you were talking about the terminal. So what I also do in the terminal, I can also start if you are if you are also used to VS Code, I can stand within this terminal. I can start my Visual Studio code within the R Studio terminal to move all my scripts I am working on, it will transfer all back to VS Code, then I work from there. But within this same terminal, I can just type R and I will still get the same R console. I can still do the same computation we are doing here in the source pane. Within the same terminal, I can turn my terminal also to an R console and I work from there. Then within this same, uh, I talk about the background jobs. We can run our scripts in a background. We can, here we have to select the script, the parts to the script in which we want to run. We select the working directory, which is still going to be this directory. Then we, we can just start the job. It will begin to run this in the background while you are doing other stuff. Your script is running in the background. Then you also talk about uh, uh, what again for this, I would skip this for now because this is Git. If you have linked your R Studio with Git, that is when you have this tab. You can push your files from here to GitHub. You can also pull from GitHub to your machine. Then you talk about the connection. This is if you have any connection to database, that is when this tab will be active. If you click on it, it will bring a dialog box. Then it might even suggest that you need to, which database do you want to connect to? Is it DocDB, Excel files? So I will close that. I don't know what's, okay, let me just talk, touch the last because this is another, you can go to your global options. Within the global options, we can look at the layout pane. This is the source pane, which is this. This is the console. This is my environment. I can add a new column here. I will add a new source. I, have, I want to add, in, I added a new column here. And I click on OK. So this is very useful. Maybe you are in a workshop. Let me open to some scripts. Maybe you are in a certain workshop. You want to run two different file addresses. I can just pick this and I drop it here. Okay, then I just pick this. So maybe you want to, you are in a workshop or a training in which you are doing. You have two different scripts in which you want to explain if you want either you want to run or you want to check the difference, you, you want to explain two different things. So you can 
you can you can even have three different pains here. So as you are working on this, you are staging this, you are running this, you can also be editing this other pain also. I think this, uh, this is a very good future. Uh, but if you want more, if this is a very cool future, which I discover that they just added a thing to the R Studio version from version 4.1. Is going to have this where we can add additional paints to our house studio, which will make our the process of working to be faster. I don't know if there are any questions, but there is also a debugging. But I don't want to go into debugging now because this is a big topic. I don't know if there are any questions. We'll stop here. Except there are any burning question, then we I can take them. I guess you know when you put the additional column. Yes, you yes. The additional column. Um, I guess, do they work entirely independently or do, do changes in one reflect in the other in any way? No, no. Let me do like this. Okay, so that I think this is it. This two, they are, they are different scripts. Yeah. So you can, I can work on this. Okay, let's run this. So while that is running, then I can go back here and still work on this other one. I can go back here and still work on this other script. Why this one is working, I have, I have, I am, this script is running. I can be editing this, then I still run this other file. Yep. Okay, yep, thank you. Let me share the Slack again. I think if we go back to the Slack, This is the slug. Are we seeing the presenter sheets? Which screen are you seeing? Okay, still the slug. Let me share. Let me share. Okay. Okay, this is the sign up sheets. So every Monday, what I do does is that I will come to this sign up sheet and check. So if you are to present any chapter, it's for you to just come in here and fill your name. So if there is any Monday, once I come in and check, there is no name there automatically. That means on that specific day, uh, I will be the one uh, to present. So if you are presenting any chapter, you just come in here and just fill your name. So if I if I am to come, if I discovered nobody have signed up for that day, I know automatically I'm the one to present that chapter. But I always encourage you sign up because it's after you sign up, you know, and you come and present because before you present, you must have gone through the chapter. Uh, you will read the chapter so that you can come and present. Because it doesn't matter, even though you, you are not good with the chapter, but just come up with something and present. We are all here to learn together. We are all here to learn. Just any chapter you are comfortable, you know, you, are, you can sign up for, uh, you can sign up for multiple sheets. But once I, once there is Monday, if I come and I check and I discover that nobody has signed up for that particular day, for that particular date, automatically that I know that on that specific day, I will be the one to present uh, the chapter. Though I know there are some certain chapter in which I know that are a little bit advanced, I know those one, I will be the one to handle it. But I always encourage you sign up uh, for more chapter because that is where you know that you actually go and read. Uh, that is where you, that is how you learn the, the book. That is how we learn the book. So if there are no questions, I think we'll end here for today. And we'll meet at uh, the same time on Monday next week.